what God's doing here, as far as, you know, spiritual growth and all that, what it really results, the result of it. It is the oneness that Christ prayed for in, in John 17. The question is, what does that mean? You know, we all say things and use words, and we think we know what those words mean, but we don't. We say words like love, truth, righteousness, justice. And when we use those words, we have in our own minds, just as I started to say in the beginning, um, when talking about how we all have a knowledge base, and our knowledge base starts out when we're kids, based on hearsay, based on our parents and others around us telling us what things are. We all start out with those ideas and the objective is to wean out the parts of those ideas which aren't true and substitute what is true. That's part of what God's doing. The other thing that he's doing is he's increasing the scope of the definitions because Fundamentally, you are what you will based on what you know. In other words, every time you make a decision, you're making a decision based on what you know, and you're either for or against what you think you know about a subject, and you make your decision accordingly. In a human being, knowledge is usually absent. Okay, we're so busy trying to do the basic things to keep body and soul together, like eat and sleep and go to the bathroom. We really don't spend much time thinking or analyzing. That's part of the human condition. It took me a really long time to learn that. So a lot of what we see as thoughtlessness or ignorance or arrogance in the human race is simply due to the fact that the people doing this, including ourselves, just aren't thinking through what they do. They just aren't used to thinking things. They don't, they haven't developed analytical skills because like practicing piano, you have to practice thinking. And so a lot of what goes wrong in the human race is due to not thinking. And the person outside can look at the non-thinking result and say, well, that was thoughtless and stupid, yeah. But the person who did it w wasn't aware of that at the time, didn't mean for it to be thoughtless and stupid. Okay, so what you're getting, I hope, is the understanding that, you know what, it's what you know that matters. Now, it's also what you will based on what you know, but if you don't know anything... Your will is going to be based on hearsay and ignorance. And when it's based on ignorance, it's based on how you feel. And how you feel can be manipulated, even by a good meal. Alright? So when we don't know something, we go based on how we feel. And even that's a volitional decision. You can actually become conditioned to not care about feeling bad, that you don't associate even pain as a bad thing, okay? So even pain and pleasure can be um, learned as being not bad or bad, either one. So you are entirely the product of your volition, but your volition is constantly dependent on how much you know. And since as a human being you are not, as it were, functioning very much in thinking or analyzing, what you know is, is you know, faulty, limited, and you can't take much knowledge. That's why learning is always like a burden. Okay, people have an attention span of five minutes because it hurts too much to pay attention and think for longer than that. That's the average attention span on YouTube. 
You can find that out if you look at the inside on your videos. If your video is longer than five minutes, people start to tune it out. So, knowledge is crushing. Is a burden to concentrate and think and analyze. So, how much more is it hard for a human being to even want to learn and actually learn Bible? It's frankly impossible. But even when it's possible, because only God can make it possible, it hurts. I mean, it doesn't actually hurt, but it's a weight. So, in addition to changing the scope of the definitions that we have in our heads, which is how I started this audio, part of what God does is He makes your soul bigger. Greek verb is oxano, and Paul uses it a lot. So do other people. It's usually translated in English as enlarged. He also uses the Greek verb megaluno. The Holy Spirit just threw that at me in Philippians 1.20 which Mary uses in the Magnificat, it means to magnify by multiplying, i.e. multiplying God's thinking in you. Okay? But the effect of that is to make what you know heavier. The scope of understanding and everything else, your analytical skills, everything increases. And it is a really... um, I don't want to call it heavy weight on the human. It's the closest thing experientially that we can come to understanding what it was like for Christ to be in hypostatic union. The knowledge is crushing. And the more and more and more knowledge you get, the more and more you understand. And the harder it is to live as a result. Because the world that you used to love starts to look tawdry and cheap like a little circus show. And it gets really hard to tolerate. You've heard me talk about that before. But where God's going with this, he's, 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 you know, in order for the oneness to occur, your soul does have to grow. And it puts you at more and more odds with your body and your secular life and people. Because it's just kind of like childhood, you know, when you were a child, everything looked big. And once you're an adult, what you used to think was big, you now realize is small. That's part of the growing pains. And it makes it real hard to get along with people. Because people are basically small-minded. And what's happening to you is you're becoming big-minded like God is big-minded. Okay, so I've talked about the weight, but there's another thing to it. Because you're becoming big-minded, because God's changing the definitions to his own, it's not only a weight of itself, but you end up, as I've been talking about in this whole war section, you end up becoming at war with yourself and becoming at war with all the every, everything you've ever known and thought about. So that every day is a war. And the biggest war is the war of love. Because you've got all kinds of loves. You're a human being. Human beings love weak and stupid things. But we don't think that they're weak and we don't think that they're stupid until we start growing out of our humanness due to what knowledge of the Bible God puts in our heads and operates. And that's what Paul's talking about in Romans 7. He's at odds with himself. And one of the hardest things to grasp, and I, I'm not saying I have, I've done it, I can only describe the problem, is this whole idea of what righteousness is. It says so many places in the Bible, especially the Old Testament, the Lord loves righteousness. He really does. We say we love righteousness or we want righteousness because we associate it with goodies. Either if I say I love righteousness or I love righteousness or I obey righteousness, I'm a good person. That's how a baby thinks. You don't really love righteousness. You don't really know what it, what it does. But you heard that it was good to do that. So you you vote for it. And that's not bad to vote for it. 
and you demand it of others, and it's not actually that bad to demand it of others either, except you're always going to be disappointed. But that's not what it is with God. He really just flat loves it. And he goes so far, this is the part that I, I, I don't know if I'll ever grow enough to actually be what I'm going to say next. He just plain loves it whether it works or not. In other words, when you and I are trying to do the right thing, a whole lot of our motive in doing that is because we expect a success. In other words, you work and work and work and work and work and you expect a result. And if you don't get it, you're really disappointed. And you might even just give up. Or you might get bitter. You work so hard on a project and it doesn't work out. So then the, the mind is tempted to blame yourself or someone else. God, it doesn't work that way in God. He doesn't... I can't, it's not exactly he doesn't care. But it doesn't matter to him whether it succeeds or not. He just loves doing it because it's right. Now, to a certain extent in the human race, we mimic some of that idea. Okay, you know, a guy, a soldier will go and give his life for his country. He'll go out blazing. He'll be shooting his guns. And maybe he doesn't kill the enemy, but he tried. And his motive in doing that is, I'm just going to do it because it's right. And he's got all the fear and the sweat and the resentment and all those other things are in him too. But he chooses, among all those competing attitudes, to go ahead and do it because it's right. And you and I have all have each done stuff like that for that reason. And it didn't work out. And, you know, the, depending on the circumstances and what it was... Generally speaking, there will be at least one or two times in our lives when we've done something just because it was right. And no matter what it cost or however much it failed it anyway, we were still glad we did it. That's as close as we come to understanding how it is with God. He actually just, I can't say doesn't care. It doesn't matter whether it works or not. He goes after a goal because it's right. And it doesn't have to succeed. It doesn't have to benefit anybody, including him. And of course, what can benefit God? Really nothing. That's what the cross was. It's a totally useless thing, the cross. Completely and utterly useless. In order for the cross itself to even have any efficacious value, God had to just pronounce it so. I'm hoping you got that by now after I've talked about this so many times and we'll be seeing this again in episode 12. It didn't, it, the cross itself had nothing of itself that got accomplished at all. Father imputed sins to son, period. That's all that happened. That's Isaiah 53, 11, 12, 10. And the effect of itself was nothing. What mattered was Christ wanted it. What mattered was Father imputed those sins to him. But the imputation into another person all by itself meant nothing. Did nothing. There was no magic property. That's what I'm trying to show here. There was no magic property inherent in our sins in Father imputing the sins, or in Christ receiving the sins. No magic at all in those activities. Father just flat pronounced us paid for because it happened. That was entirely his own volition, entirely his own ruling. The, act, the activity itself 
didn't accomplish a thing. This is something Calvin would ne- could never understand. And that's, that's really a crack up because he's all the one talking about God being sovereign. The action of God to God did not accomplish a thing of itself. What mattered was father was willing. What mattered was son was willing. What mattered was spirit was willing. And who did it matter to? Each of them. There was no magical property inherent in our sins. No magical property inherent in Father imputing our sins to Christ. No magical property in Christ have receiving the sins and hurting the way he did, going to true hell. There was no magical property inherent in the Spirit holding Christ's soul together. Oh, that was a miracle. Would have to be. The human being wouldn't be able to take the imputation of our sins if the Holy Spirit didn't empower it. But there's no magic There's no salvation magic in any of those things. None of those things inherently paid for or saved us at all. I have to ask myself, what? Has theology been completely stupid for 2,000 years? They don't understand that those activities are no more magical than the garden? There was nothing magical about the fruit that the woman took. It was because she was willing and God pronounced, hi, you're spiritually dead now. There was nothing inherent in the fruit. There's no mystical property in fruit that can make you know God. Or even good and evil, which was the name of the tree. There was no mystical property about our sins, no mystical property in the imputation, no mystical property of the thinking of Christ, no mystical property in the blood of Christ, which a whole lot of people mistake as being literal. The Bible never says that. There was no mystical property in the Holy Spirit holding his soul together. I mean, you can wrap your hands around an apple... And relative to the apple, you're supernatural. You have a property of holding the apple. The apple cannot hold itself in your hands. You have to hold it. Okay, so the Holy Spirit held Christ's soul together. That's not mystical. It was the attitude. And it was Father flat pronouncing, Hi, everybody who believes in you is saved now. Because he wanted to. Why didn't Calvin understand that? I don't know. How can Christian theologians be so damn dumb for 2,000 years that they don't get this? We all know it was a juridical imputation. We all know that Christ himself didn't actually become sin. So how can we not figure out that nothing actually happened there? Activities happened that had no actual value at all. The value was in the willingness of the participants, who were three, not just one. Father being willing to give his son pain. Son wanting to receive it. Spirit wanting to hold him together, as it were, tying him down so he could receive the pain. That's what mattered. And so, the same wills that willed, well, the same wills will, okay, you're saved now. That same attitude, that same just arbitrary willingness, is how God thinks about righteousness. Now you have to say, well, but then, what's the value of righteousness? Bingo! When you and I want to do something righteous, we're expecting a benefit to come from that. I do the right thing and I'm going to get some kind of reward for doing the right thing. And quite frankly, most of the time we do. 
And when it gets hard is when we don't. So then is it the righteousness that we really care about or the benefit we get from it? See, that's the distinction. When you grow in Christ and he makes you bigger and bigger and bigger and changes all of your definitions, the hardest one to cope with and the one that Satan couldn't cope with, but Christ did, is what if you get no benefit for it? How is it Satan's big argument here? As I keep trying to stress in different ways, but I keep learning more ways to have to talk about it. Satan's big argument is, how righteous is it if there's no benefit? And God's saying, it, I don't care if there's a benefit. So you see why Satan is arguing that God is arbitrary? God just flat wants a thing and says, this is good, this is bad, this is what I want. But if it doesn't produce a benefit, why is it good? And the hard part about living with God that I, I, I don't know if I'll, I'll ever actually learn how to do this. The hard part is that you fall in love with him. If you grow at all in the spiritual life, you get to the point where you fall in love with God. My pastor spent a lot of time on that, and he says that's the hall hallmark characteristic of spiritual adulthood. You fall in love with God. Okay, whoopee, you can't do anything with it. You're just like a little puppy dog all the time. He doesn't expect you to do anything with it. See, you don't have to be right. It's righteous that you don't have to be right. It's righteous that you don't have to perform. And you would think, well, but wouldn't that be the very definition of unrighteousness? Obeying God is righteous, so disobeying Him would not be righteous. Yeah, but it's righteous of God not to require it. And then you say, well, but the Bible says in a thousand different ways, obey, 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 obey. Yeah, but it's also um, unrighteous if God says obey when he knows you can't. So on the one hand, it's obey, yes. On the other hand, if you don't obey, well, you're still saved, aren't you? And yeah, everything has its consequences, but um, you never lose your, you never lose him. That's why so many Christians think you've got to work for your salvation. doesn't seem fair. Yeah, but see, God is pronouncing on what is and isn't righteous. It's unrighteous if it's righteous. It's righteous if it's unrighteous. There's an actual whole layer of things, as it were. Ideas, principles, activities, statuses that fit in that category. And this is what Satan's just completely bollocksed about. How can it be unrighteous to be righteous? Well, think about it. If anything could dent God, that would be unrighteous. Okay, but if nothing can dent God and he doesn't allow everything bad to exist, that's unrighteous too. So what ends up happening is that after falling in love with God, he takes you on this round robin to teach you how to love everything, no matter how unrighteous it is. And everyone. We all talk about, oh, we love the brethren. I love you. I, I, it makes me so sick I want to throw up when I hear people say, I love you. You don't even know me. You don't love me. They treat love like, you know, it's just they bandy the word about to make them feel good about themselves. Oh, see, I love somebody. I said I love you, therefore I do. Oh, yeah? You wouldn't know what love was if it be you. The person really loves has a lot of trouble saying, I love you. Because he never thinks he does. So 
So what he's teaching us to do, and I haven't really learned this yet, I'm just explaining the problem. He teaches you to really, truly, honestly love righteousness just because, and it doesn't have to benefit you at all. You're just going to do it because it's right. Even if it doesn't work. Even if you screw up. Even if everything screws up and you fail. Even if it's like Hamburger Hill. I don't know if you saw that movie, but you should. Star Steven Weber. It's one of the most impressionable movies I've ever watched. Especially at the end. Where they're all climbing up Hamburger Hill and they climb up two steps and they're in the rain and the mud and they fall down two steps. So they're not making any progress at all. And then after they finally take it, which was practically a miracle, I want to say it was like two days, three days later, the politicians awarded it to the enemy. So all those deaths were for nothing. They called it Hamburger Hill because so many people got murdered there. Sisyphus, which is my avatar. Do you go up the hill just to go up the hill? God does. And sometimes, you know, it works out and sometimes it doesn't. But that doesn't alter him, that doesn't alter his standard, that doesn't alter his desire. It's just a bonus if it works. You know, because God isn't going to, you know, manipulate free will. That's something Calvinists don't understand either. He does it just because. And you end up loving him just because. And because you end up loving him just because, he holds your soul together. That's Second Corinthians 5.14, which he just flew into my mind. Just like he held Christ's soul together on the cross. And he wants you to fall in love with righteousness even when there's no benefit and it doesn't seem righteous at all and that's a real dicey proposition because a lot of things that the world considers immoral are not the world has its price they call something righteous if the benefit is there but if the benefit isn't there it's not righteous anymore God has a different point of view and I'm not saying that I accept it like he does, because I don't. I just, like I said, I'm just describing the problem. I know what it is. Every day I struggle with this thing. It's like what Paul's talking about in Romans 7. I know it's good and true, but I don't live that way. You have to fall. You fall in love with him, and then you fall. You fall. Well, you 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 fall in love sort of gradually with the standards and with him at the same time, and then it all reifies into him. That spiritual adulthood. And then he takes you on this round robin because he wants you to see how much he loves. And he, and and you're sort of like, it's like you're clinging to the fact that it's him who has this attitude and you want to have it because it's him who has the attitude. But he wants you to mature in the added, same attitude he has irrespective of whether it's because of him. It's a killer. Because what it ends up meaning, it's the scope of what this means. That you will kill yourself if you have to. To do something because it's right. Even though there's absolutely no benefit whatsoever. And it's just like Hamburger Hill. And it's just going to go to the enemy afterwards. In other words, you know you're not going to succeed. The cross was a worthless exercise. That's the whole point about it. That's why the Bible makes such a stink about it. It was a completely worthless exercise. The only thing that made it efficacious was God just flat said so. When Paul's talking in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10 about my strength is made perfect in weakness, I think is how they translate it in English. My pastor, when he went through that, said, made operational, and it's in our ghetto, anyhow. 
and teleo, teleo is the actual verb there. It's made complete. My power is made complete in weakness. Because it's full circle. In other words, we think of power as accomplishing something. In other words, you're, you're, at point A, the thing that needs to be done requires power. So point B, there's power. Point C, it's completed when the power overcomes whatever the thing was. And, and it, it, the thing is defeated and changed. Okay, but the reverse is also true. Point A, there's nothing. Point C is what you need to get to, but you do nothing to get there. You just let it hit you. Okay, well, but if you do nothing to get there, then the thing didn't change. If anything, you're the one who got defeated. Yeah. And then God just flat pronounces it paid. When, in fact, what happened was, you're the one who got hit, you're the one who got defeated, you're the one who got put down, and then you die. That's what happened at the cross. That's what happens at the end of a successful believer's life. What happened to Paul? 2 Corinthians 4, 7 and 8, he says he got crowned. Okay, but what actually happened to Paul? He didn't do anything. It was about 68 AD, Nero did another little persecution thing. Paul's a Roman citizen, so somewhere on the Appian Way, to licked her with his axe, just cut Paul's head off, end of story. There was no relationship between the crown that Paul got in his life down here. None. To the world, and especially to all the believers who were there at the time, was they had to scatter. It was all persecution. It was all, oh, you know, we can't even talk anymore. We have to go into hiding. That's why the book of Hebrews doesn't have a named author but a reference to Italy in chapter 13. The, the guy couldn't afford to put his name on it. Timothy got released from prison because just after Nero did what he did to Paul, that was the year of the four emperors, and what normally happens when a new emperor succeeds because Nero was murdered, actually killed himself. Um, no, he tried to kill himself, and they ended up murdering him instead. I forget which. But the point is, is that was like, I want to say January, June of 69 AD. And right after that, I, was it Nerva? Hmm, I forget the exact orders. Vitellius, Otho. Um, was Nerva first? No, Nerva was last. And then came um, Vespasian. Vespasian, then Nerva Pryor, Galba, Otho, Vitellius. Okay, I think it was Vitellius who was next. It might have been Galba. But whenever a new a new um, emperor rises to power, he pardons and he gives out a donative, you know, a certain couple of coins to each soldier, which ends up being a lot of money. Buy him off for their loyalty. And when I say a couple of coins, I mean it's a sizable amount of money in that day. That's what happened. A couple of months after Paul died, maybe it was six months, Nero's gone. New emperor rises, so Timothy was released. That's Hebrews 13. So it was sometime just after Nero died that Hebrews 13 was written. Because it says Italy. They won't even say where in Italy. So, what happened as a result of Paul dying? Well, the Christian movement was scattered. They had to go underground. So what good got accomplished by Paul's death? Nothing. What good got accomplished by Christ's death? Well, all the Christians had to go underground. Earthwise, down here, nothing righteous got accomplished. And frankly, the cross itself, 
You can't assign any kind of magical property to the assignment of our sins to Christ on the cross. God just flat says, hi, this is what I'm going to call the result. I just baptized this event with this result. Paul get, gets killed on the Appian Way. Of course, he knew that beforehand. I'm going to just crown him. There is no inherent relationship between what Paul did and what he thought and what he got from God. There's no inherent relationship between what happened on the cross and what we get from God. God just flats us all. See how arbitrary that is? And that's the attitude that we end up having to get in order to have that oneness with God about the right thing. You do it just because. No reward. No inherent connection between what you're doing and the result. It's just the right thing to do, the right thing to think, the right thing to want, the right attitude to have. And there's no benefit whatsoever. When you get that far, you're coming the closest you're going to come to in this life to absoluteness, which looks just like being arbitrary. And that's the spiritual goal of development that he wants. It's an attitudinal development inside the soul. You'll never be able to perform it. That's one of the points about this. You just have to want it to want it, even if you can't perform it. And that ends up being one of the biggest pressures in life. Is to have, and that's what Paul's talking about in Romans 7. I have the right attitude. I really want this thing. I really believe in it. I know what the Bible says is good and right and true. And yet, I look at myself and I don't perform. Yep. See, you're not getting any benefit for knowing. You're not getting any benefit for having all these great, wonderful insights and knowing God. You're not getting any benefit for that. All it does cause you trouble. All it does make you feel weak and stupid and small. And you can't even perform better. Christians think that, oh, if I learn Bible or if I'm spiritually growing, I'll be able to perform better. No, you won't. All you'll do is know how you don't measure up. And all you do is get weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. See, because God is divorcing the benefit from right. In other words, you want it because it's right. Not because of what benefit it gives you. You learn to love God just because of the way he thinks. Which is the sum total of who he is. Not because he's God. There's no benefit. Because that's Satan's big argument. There's no benefit to having a relationship with God. You know, well, it's not love if there's a benefit. If there's a benefit, then what you love is a benefit, not the object. It's killer. But I hope you can see by now, well, Brian and I can't argue against this as much as I'd like to. Yeah, I wish I were an atheist too. But how do you argue against this? But how can you live with it? And I don't know. It's just every day I get up. He's God, I'm not. That's all I know. And he wants this and it pleases him. So I want to want it too. Mm, okay, so now I'm becoming arbitrary. Loving righteousness because he does. Not really loving it because, you know, I, I can't yet. But he does, so then I'm motivated to get up. But then what happens is I find myself choosing to want to do a thing that's right, even though it doesn't work, doesn't do me any good. 
And then the real big kicker is choosing to do what's right for people who hate him. That's always been my big sticking point. I don't care what a person is. If the person's interested in God, I'm attracted. If they're not interested in God, I don't want to even be around them. And most people aren't interested in God, so I, I don't socialize. It just it just chaps me. So how do you learn to love those people when they don't want him? But he loves them anyway. And it's righteous to love them anyway. How so? But he does. Okay, so because he does, I want him. And what he's saying is, why do I anyway just because? So what I, he's always doing, I, cause the only way I can get through this, maybe you got another way, let me know, is Isaiah 54 1. He's making good out of this. I have to pee, I have to wash the dishes, I have to listen to some person who I know doesn't want God, which makes them completely ugly to me. I just want to, I just want to throttle them. Okay, but he didn't think like that. So it's like Isaiah 54, 1, he's going to get me through this. Being around somebody who doesn't want God is like fingernails on a blackboard to me. Okay, but I shouldn't think like that. And he doesn't think like that. He wants and loves just because. He loves righteousness just because, and it's righteous to love the unrighteous. It's righteousness to allow all unrighteousness to exist even if forever. It's righteous to let everything be free, to be what it is, even if forever. So you know what that ends up meaning? That you just basically kill yourself for the right of the unrighteous to go on being unrighteous. And Satan says, sorry, baby. That can't be righteousness. And God says, well, excuse me, but if I don't do that, how can I be righteous? Now, those are just arguments on his part. He's just arguing back to Satan. Those are words he's using, and they're right and true. But that's not his real attitude. His attitude is, hi, I just love And righteousness is righteousness because it's absolute. And nothing else is. Okay, but the big half of that is it's righteous to love unrighteousness. Okay, so here we are all. We're spending our whole life learning to be good at two-shoes and obey God and love God and love what's good and hate what's bad and stay away from dancing and drinking and those who like it. You know, because we we're all legalistic. We have no idea what righteousness is. And then all of a sudden you have to reverse all that. Spend all your time being goody little tissues and, you know, oh, I'm staying away from the bad stuff. And now you're supposed to wallow in it? Because if you love something that's unrighteous, that means you're spending a lot of time on it. Even though it never works, it never gets better, it never changes. Our sins did not change when they hit Christ on the cross. They did not change. They just hit him. End of story. The sins didn't change. Time didn't change. Nothing changed. It was a sadistic act that he wanted, so he was a masochist. And that's pretty much how Satan thinks about both of them. Father and son in particular. That's what he's saying in Matthew 4. He's accusing Christ of being a masochist. He's accusing Father of being a sadist. 
Well, but aren't you a masochist? If you're basically placing your whole life and all your time at the disposal of the weak, the stupid, the small, the sickly. And by the way, they're never going to be thankful. They're never even going to understand what you're doing. And they're not going to change either. But you do it anyway. Doesn't that sound immoral? Welcome to the world of the cross. And honey, I don't know if I'm going to learn to love righteousness like that. But I know that it's only righteous to be like that. Because that's the way God is. And it really does please Him. And I cannot fathom how and why it pleases Him so much. I just know it does. But I'm not going to finish my growth in the spiritual life if I don't learn to think the way he does and love it the way he does. Because that's what gets you to the cross. Maybe you'll make it. That's for me, I don't know. But hopefully you can see now more of what righteousness is and more of what it means when it says in the Bible so many times the Lord loves righteousness and how big that definition is and how weighty it is and how important spiritual growth and oneness with him it is to get that same attitude. So I don't know if I'll make it. In any event, I hope you do. Peace out.